per account. Okay. Thank you for thank you for reminding me about uh, recording this. So take it away, Mark. <clears throat> oh, this is the poster, um, which basically comes from one of our first projects, um, which is a, a Wiley Griffin historical monument, which is not just it's at his grave site in the Masonic. And um, this was taken a few months ago. Um, so Gamshi uh, Lakawan, and I'm going to apologize for my for any mispronunciation. I learned that phrase from Esther Stutzman uh, years and years ago. Um, so excuse my Choctaw LA accent if I'm mispronouncing it. So, but it's uh, greetings in uh, Yankala Kalapuya. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, as is traditional, those ancestors and native nations who have come before us and those in future generations coming up from the ground to quote uh, the great peacemaker of Iroquois Six Nations. So um, I'd like to start out with a quiz and I'm not gonna necessarily monitor the chat but uh, this is gonna be one of the features on our uh, website, which is still under construction. Four streets named for people of color, starting with the most recent in within the city limits of Eugene. So you can use the chat function and um, Marsha, if you would, monitor that. I will do that. <clears throat> we have an answer. Um, hmm. We have okay. three. An Annie Mims, Breonna Taylor uh, Street, Sam Reynolds Street, another for Sam Reynolds, another for uh, MLK Boulevard, and then another for Sam. Okay. Two more. Okay. How did they do? Any name doesn't exist yet, but good. You good a good effort for uh, a street that's proposed, starting with the most recent, and I'll give you another fifteen seconds. So the answer yep. is. Unthank Street mm. after De Norville Unthank. Sam Reynolds Street, Martin Luther King Boulevard, and Moon Lee Lane. Mm. Don Moon Lee, uh, who is such a duck. He had his ashes scattered in front of Straub Hall. He was in charge of U of O student housing. And uh, his Moonlee Lane is uh, like 19th and Agate. So there is a history, of course, behind all those uh, streets. And uh, some of them involved uh, more of a battle than others. And as Bob alluded to, there's definitely context in terms of um, how history is remembered. And part of our project was kind of, we were once told that um, by, you know, an expert that, you know, whose thing was Northwest black people, um, yeah, at the University of Oregon, and he was senator at the University of Oregon at the time, and I asked him, so how come in your books there's nothing about Eugene? And he said, there's no material here. <laughs> so, okay, no material, but all right. I didn't stop Sherry. Um, so, Unthank Street <clears throat> is basically the most recent um, Wiley Griffin, uh, and Annie Mims are basically not built yet, but they're part of the proposed uh, downtown riverfront project by EWEB. 
So Unthank is uh, towards the Bethel area, Sam Reynolds Street, uh, which was for at least 25 years, uh, Sam R Street, Martin Luther King Boulevard, and uh, Moon Lee Lane. So we take, our, take the project's name from um, after indigenous and two-spirited uh, poet, uh, Langston Hughes, uh, which basically stated, I too, um, Sing in the two, in black and indigenous and two-spirited. Mm -hmm. And like that poem, I too am Eugene kind of seeks to tell the story and histories of people of color in the Eugene Springfield area and also their allies. Um, many of their uh, white allies and other allies as well, who choose may not, maybe not to uh, ethnically identify. So our intention was to create a basis for mutual understanding and, base, and continue collaboration. So a lot of times, if we throw the initial stone, not at a person, like in the river, you create ripples, the ripples go out and they disappear and become part of the general historical float. So, when we look at I Too Am Eugene, the Langton Hughes poem on the right, on the left, and um, my contribution using my country fair poetic license. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, all our interrelated histories uh, often get buried in what's called in ethnic studies the Columbus Discovered America narrative. Um, I remember being at a lecture with uh, the late Howard Zinn um, at the University of Oregon on the 500 year anniversary of Columbus's first contact with the Taino nation. And I asked him the question, uh, what's the best thing you could say about Columbus? And he said, 500 years of resistance. Okay. So often this is a struggle essentially to uh, assert your humanity in the face of um, uh, continued oppression. So one of my uh, role models in terms of being a Maroon, that is a black indigenous um, freedom fighter and Malcolm X is one of those examples. We need more light about each other. Light creates understanding. Understanding creates love, love creates patience, and patience creates unity. I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for justice, no matter who it's for or against, and who's against justice for whatever reason they may be. Um, so just to reiterate what Bob was saying in, in the bio, so we, that is Sherry and I, basically are a multi-ethnic couple raising multi-ethnic kids and grandkids in a town, a state, and a country really designed to suppress our traditional human healthy expression. And there is a multi-millennial tradition of expression versus many centuries of attempted suppression. So when people talk about white supremacy and I say, okay, within the sweep of 200 to 300,000 years of homo sapiens, white supremacy is only 800 years old. So put in that context, um, I have hope, but I don't necessarily feel that, uh, that that simple hope alone um, is sufficient uh, to create more humanity. So this idea of it's not really taught in school, um, but we are basically teaching our kids and our grandkids in our home training. So this is traditional to build uh, what the term is micro resistance skills in what's called BIPOC kids and their allies. Now, micro resistance, you know, I think I was, as far as I know, um, 
the first person in Eugene to uh, use the term microaggressions, racial microaggressions in 1991, um, quoted in the Register Guard. And I had to explain what that was because they thought I was crazy for saying it, but look, be true to this. This is black psychology. We believe racism exists and we have developed a whole taxonomy on and terms on how to fight it. And part of that, basically thinking that uh, racism is a disease process or a mental illness, I go so far as calling it a co-occurring disorder. That is, it's both an addiction and a mental illness. And you have to recognize that you need to give up your addiction and become more human. So Dr. Chester Pierce, who came up with the term microaggressions, basically said micro resistance is how you deal with microaggressions. And micro resistance can simply take the form of you're protecting yourself by the attitude that you have. You may not even say anything or you may respond in a way that uh, not only protects you, but also changes and intervenes with uh, the person that you're dealing with. So we were also warned by beginning this project uh, that there'd be resistance. Um, and just to kind of quote uh, what uh, a phrase that's attributed to Gandhi, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, uh, then they fight you, then you're accepted uh, sometimes without credit or attribution and accepted with attribution, replicated, we hope, and then forgotten and then the whole process repeats in another generation, such as the way of human progress. So we were warned uh, that you're probably going to unearth truths people would rather keep buried, like uh, the fact that there was a clan uh, a Eugene Ku Klux Klan um, that had infiltrated uh, the university, the city government, county government, law enforcement, school districts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and continues to this day. Uh, so Sherry began her research in January of 97 uh, because of what was going on in one of our sons, in our both of our sons' classrooms in one uh, if those of you know Adagio, our youngest son, in his elementary school, only one classroom out of the entire school was actually going to explain why we were having a Martin Luther King holiday. Not in a school assembly, one classroom. And then we asked, well, okay, what are you doing for Black History Month? Well, nothing. Do you want to do something? Wow, that's kind of your job, right? And then another son, our other son, basically um, part of his home training, because this was my home training, uh, basically dealt with the reality of Afro-Europeans and mixed race people, uh, commonly known as mulatto. And Beethoven is described by his student, Carl Cerny, as a mulatto. There's only one use of the term mulatto in the English language, first generation black white mix. Oh, Beethoven couldn't be black, he's German. Okay, stop. Uh, so Beethoven's not black, our son was told. So we need to basically go to the history to a people is like memory to a person. And if you wanna think of racism as a pandemic or endemic, um, like herpes or COVID, it attacks human unity. And racism normalizes what I call in an ethnic studies and also historical context, historical amnesia. Uh, if you're not taught it, uh, it is forgotten, but some people remember it because they have to remember it. So you devise a counter virus based on uh, non-racist truths. So we, because um, I have slaves in my background, but I also have natives in my background. And I also understand 
by looking at the history, if only one fifth of African people were enslaved, involved in the slave trade, that meant 80% were remained in Africa to basically go through what they were going through. Um, so we learned that slaves were smart, but actually had to hide how smart they were. And we knew that before uh, the book and the movie 12 Years a Slave, um, because my great great grandmother uh, made the Middle Passage sold by Muslims from Morocco. She lived in Morocco, uh, made the Middle Passage as a four year old, and then was immediately sold away from her um, mother and infant sister in Virginia and never saw them again. So she taught herself how to read which basically started a family tradition in my family of dad learned to read at two, I learned to read at four, I'm a bit of a slacker, taught my kids to read at five, and Sherry also followed suit. Teach your kids to perform academically before they get to school, because you can't necessarily trust the school to teach them. Because we grew up in the segregated you know, school segregation. So that was our experience too. So black and white race mixing, according to the science that created your cell phone and this computer, if human, the human homo sapiens is two to 300,000 years old, the white phenotype emerged 22,000 years ago. Race mixing has been going on for that long. Why are people tripping about it? now. Then also black native mixing uh, was 2,800 years old based on the Olmec heads. And if you understand that pyramid builders can, if you can build a pyramid, you can build a transoceanic sailing ship. Pyramid builders kick it with other pyramid builders and they meet and converse and gene mix and technology trade. That's what the natives said about us. And we understood that what's called Turtle Island, we called the circuit of the world, that is African people, the longest continent reaching from the North Pole to the South Pole unbroken. And the only way you can find that out is by sailing it. So that's part of the narrative that I grew up with, with books and scholars and other people to, to see and talk about that. So in teaching to transgress that a bell hooks books, you know, sometimes people try and destroy you precisely because they recognize your power, not because they don't see it, but because they see it and they don't want it to exist. So Samuel Thurston, this is one of the things that we began to uncover and try and look at mm -hmm. teaching people about. So Samuel Thurston, territory, Oregon territory, territorial legislator, um, allegedly Thurston High School is named and the area of uh, East Springfield is named after his son, but apple don't fall far from the tree. So he wrote, the reason that you want to ban free African-American citizens from Oregon is that basically black people, and he wrote this, black people mix with Indians. And whenever they mix with Indians, they create a mixed race that in his opinion was inimical to whites. And so the way to prevent that is to basically ban free black people. 2,800 years too late, but of course he wasn't educated from that particular point of view. So if history to a people, you know, Sam Person warned, wanted to ban free blacks, American citizens, because we mix with Indians, uh, we're not really hostile to whites. Maroons aren't hostile to whites. We just love freedom. And we will actually, uh, like the Maroons of Jamaica, and the maroon societies that existed 
outside of every place in the so-called new world that had slavery. So that means the United States, that means Mexico, Brazil, South America, they're maroon societies. Um, so we have a particular flavor like Malcolm X, like Frederick Douglass, like Crispus Attucks, like Jimi Hendrix, Tina Turner, <laughs> Jesse Jackson. <laughs> you, you catch my drift, right? <laughs> We're not hostile to whites, we just love freedom and we'll fight to restore it, protect it and preserve it. And so obviously he didn't come from that historical perspective um, and because there was a history um, for that perspective. So you teach your kids what they need to know without necessarily depending on the educational system to do it and various forms of the talk uh, are necessary. So Oregon laws specifically mentioned racially mixed people uh, to be banned and targeted uh, for discrimination. So biracial people, uh, famous mulattoes, for example, uh, Charlotte, the queen of England, George III's uh, wife spoke uh, seven languages, Mozart composed music for her, the, um, uh, the uh, bird of paradise flower is named after her. Uh, Beethoven, Thomas, and Alexander Dumas. Thomas is a general fought in Napoleon's armies. Alexander, his uh, son, wrote the Three Musketeers. Uh, Schwarzkopf is a, a German family of royal descent. Schwarzkopf, black head. Schwartz and Negar, which means literally black and from Africa. And Arnold confirmed that on Letterman. Crispus Attucks, Frederick Douglass, Langston Hughes, Malcolm, a few other folks. George M. Bush, not the president, but a black man who came in on a wagon train, married a white woman, uh, settled in the Oregon Territory, which at that point called what basically was the, the state of Washington. Moses Harris, uh, who was a trapper and scout. So we, Sherry's initial research, which was quite extensive, um, Oregon is a Southern state in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. And so was there a civil rights movement in Eugene and, this, and the rest of the state? Yes. Uh, were there multiracial coalitions resisting uh, racism in Eugene? Yes. Uh, even if it was as simple as letting a black student stay in your home or sell or rent to a black person, um, there was resistance uh, even if it was somewhat passive. Uh, or join an organization like CORE, the NAACP, et cetera, or register people to vote or get elected to public office and change the laws as my fourth favorite Republican, Mark Hatfield did. He was one of the people that I had interviewed for the project. So Sherry found out all this information and wasn't really being taught in our, to our kids and even when our kids went to college, they weren't being taught then. Um, so she started her search in microfilm and night library, basically taking five newspapers from 1850 to 1997, day by day. Uh, and basically searched in U of O special collections uh, with the archive, the late archivist, Keith Richard. Um, and basically you ask people, ask different questions. Uh, for example, was there bus segregation? Because the initial theme was civil rights movement and Montgomery bus boycott. Well, did that happen here in Eugene? Um, and that kind of yielded uh, the Wiley Griffin picture which is being used in the poster. Uh, we got that from Paul Headley. Um, so we didn't uncover segregated buses. Uh, Paul let us know that people actually would not get on buses driven by a woman or a black person. Uh, 
And also people objected to blacks riding in the front of the bus. Like uh, Paul told us about uh, Sam Reynolds uh, taking, I think it's the 96 line that goes out to uh, Blue River, out to Mackenzie Bridge. Um, and he had a friend that was the bus driver. And while in town, one of the stops in town, a white man objected to Sam riding in front to talk with his friend, the bus driver. And he said, what do you think that cross is up there for? Hmm, you mean the cross is not a war memorial? Like the popular narrative would suggest. So old school library research, we looked at books, dissertations, microfilm, uh, archives, old city records. Uh, so for example, um, in the bibliography of the Invisible Empire of the West, which was written uh, the Clan and Gown chapter was written by Eckhart Toy, who received degrees from the University of Oregon and Dr. Toy's uh, specific research is on uh, extreme white racist groups. He wasn't an extreme right racist himself, um, but uh, he found it fascinating. And in his bibliography, it basically showed uh, a clan list that I actually wrote to the LADA's office and got a copy of it. And it confirmed the LA, the clan list, uh, the Eugene clan list um, that was published in the Salem Capital Journey. So to date, no Eugene institution, except my class at LCC has ever published, uh, even though clan lists are nearly a century old. In fact, when I even tried to publish it at eWeb uh, during Black History Month, they actually refused to air the presentation. And that was 21st century, yeah. So no wonder they don't want you to talk about it. And so Dunn School, even though the school district says it's not Frederick Dunn, it's actually his family, Dunn Hall or the renamed Dunn Hall, the first U of O coach uh, to bring black players to the Ducks was actually a Klansman. Uh, and that Klansman, Shy Huntington, uh, played Uncle Tom at the Very Little Theater uh, production of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, <laughs> so did he do that in blackface? I don't know. I've asked that of the Very Little Theater. They kind of didn't answer me, which I guess is an answer. But, you know, so I was one, a friend of mine once suggested you should actually do a black man's take us uh, on the, Ku Klux, the Eugene Ku Klux Klan as comedy because it is kind of funny, ironic, haven't done it yet. Um, but early in our research, we found this Eugene historical context search that the struggle, uh, that said the struggle of non-white groups in early Eugene, though often understated, <laughs> yeah, is an important part of the community's history. Cultural groups that resided in or near Eugene city during this initial period of growth and development included Native Americans, African Americans, Chinese, and Japanese. Uh, there's little information regarding the occupations or residency of these groups in Eugene specifically, but it seems that tolerance for the non-white population was low. So, this was published in the late 80s. And uh, all right, so you think that there's little information, but you don't fund any initiative to address that. So we we're wondering, okay, well, I guess it just is falling to us. So there's a larger story that we found uh, looking in places that professional historians really hadn't looked at. So there was a Kalapuya, a Chinese, a Latino, Pacific Islander, Jewish, Japanese, African American, and an Arab face uh, to Eugene. 
And so we were lim limited our research to ethnic minorities and the whites that helped them uh, to hope, hope that other communities might organize on their own historical benefit. Uh, we found interesting historical collaborations and uh, collaborated on historical events uh, such as this and other things uh, that had happened uh, before and that are ongoing. And we also engaged in what I call historical activism. So uh, taking history, not just as an academic uh, publishing exercise, but also let's make it visible so that people see it, can visit it, can you know, talk about whose street is named and all those other kinds of things. So Wiley Griffin historical marker, Talking Stones, Sam Reynolds Street, Martin Luther King Boulevard, um, the LCCBSU engaged in, uh, because people do civil war reenactments, we decided let's do a tent city reenactment and house black history. Um, all right, so a Southern state in the Northwest, in the Pacific Northwest complete with exclusion laws, which inspired the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution, poll taxes, redlining, housing, job and business discrimination, racial terror, cross burnings, a lynching, um, law enforcement, either ignoring partic or participating in that terror uh, and general historical ignorance. So for example, uh, while I was a counselor at uh, Churchill High School uh, during the era of 4J's Racial Justice Task Force, one of the narratives basically detailing um, racism within the school was an incident where a white teacher observed the following interaction where a, a white teacher spat on the black student teacher, presumably from the U of O, uh, spat on their shoes and basically said, now you can shine them for it. Um, and then our own daughter basically taking our research and making a senior project in international high school and then being told that there is no racism in Eugene from a white woman in Alabama. And then when I tried to describe to a counseling organization that had used the term uh, an African-American family was in a tar baby situation. So I was trying to set up a diversity training for them and explaining, you know, things like Emmett Till. And I was told, Emmett Till, shut up. That didn't happen. You're making that up. Okay. 50 year anniversary and a story on PBS that I referred her to when she said that, but Okay, a lot of historical ignorance. So our first gig uh, was the Northwest Pioneers uh, Black History Exhibit in Valley River in 1997. Uh, we displayed three history panels so that I had gotten from uh, the Eugene delivery of the Institute for African American Mobilization, a culturally specific prevention training that was at uh, First United Methodist Church uh, in 93. Uh, these are the panels. And basically I had been leaking some of those panels, various pictures to various people that said, you know, Ferry Street Chapel, what's that? Um, you know, Shy Huntington and the, um, the Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, Who's, who is uh, the woman who's playing Aunt Jemima? Um, you know, Margaret Johnson's mother, who also reported the lynching of a man that she knew on camera. Uh, so basically put together by these two sisters, Star uh, Jackson and Brid Bridget Fambolet, uh, who basically created Martin Luther King uh, theater company, which yours truly was uh, an actor within both of those plays and also 
uh, The Meeting, which is uh, Jeffrey Stetson's play of a mythical meeting um, one week before Malcolm is killed between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And so they gave me these panels, uh, which formed a core of the initial offering. So our first project proposal uh, was basically a Wiley Griffin Memorial plaques uh, to LTD uh, because of his connection with the transit system, eWeb because of his house in the parking lot, and uh, the Eugene Masonic Cemetery basically replaced, initially replacing the headstone, his headstone, but then that kind of grew into a historical monument on the path by his grave. So this classic picture that everybody's using in all these various uh, commemorations, um, we obtained that uh, from Paul Headley. And so the three places that Eventually, uh, each one of those has, is a story in itself. The first one uh, was at LTD uh, in their new, then it was their new downtown center. And now it's pretty old. It's, you know, the early 21st century, uh, the, the aughts. Um, then the Sonic Cemetery uh, Stone, which is 2013. And then eWeb plaque, uh, which is 2019, I believe. Now, um, you were correct in talking about Annie Mims Street, but uh, since it's the downtown riverfront, which is still being constructed, um, you're technically correct, but it actually isn't up yet. And then other commemorations, uh, Rosa Parks Plaza, uh, there's a Wiley Griffin um, uh, observance there. There's been a Wiley Griffin um, mural on Willamette Street. How am I doing for time? Um, it's, you're almost 45, you're 45 minutes into your time. Yeah. So you said uh, for Q and A, what did you want me to go to? Uh, well, you could go as much as another uh, half hour. Cool. Uh, we want to shut off at at nine. Yes. Okay. All right. Roger that. All right. So I um. Getting coming to Oregon, I never actually. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, so coming to Oregon, I wasn't really expecting to do that. But it turned out, for example, my father came to speak at the University of Oregon in 1968 and gave an interesting speech, which turned out to be part of the playbook that I was acting out. And part of that playbook is. You not only have to pick your own leaders, like he suggested in the speech, uh, because it's not necessarily your politicians, it's you also have to understand the history of your place. And so African Americans were present before the founding of the state. Uh, and who gets remembered uh, in terms of history or made visible and who is forgotten uh, in mainstream Oregon history becomes an interesting question. So the visible ones, Marcus Lopez, uh, from he was from Cape Verde, uh, and he's an able-bodied seaman. So he might be described historically as Captain Gray's cabin boy, but he's a free able-bodied seaman carrying a cutlass. That's not a slave. <laughs> you don't give slaves swords, <laughs> right? And Cape Verde was basically a Portuguese colony for like 300 years before that time. So uh, lots of sailors and lots of black people sail the ocean blue, even from the United States. Uh, York, uh, and so Marcus is noted because he got killed by the Indians because he objected to them taking his cutlass and got killed. York, who is a William Clark slave or manservant, 
uh, Moses Black Harris, no relation, uh, who's a trapper and wagon train scout. Uh, Jacob Vanderpool, uh, who of uh, the archives and special collections of the U of O basically identified him as a Salem, Oregon businessman uh, who was the only one, according to the historical record, uh, deported in 1851 under the exclusion laws. Now, he was a business owner um, that was essentially uh, discriminated against. So in Eugene, Wiley Griffin. Now, in terms of in invisible Eugenians, uh, Wiley wasn't the first African-American to be here, to live here. There were African-Americans in Eugene and Sherry found this out by going through, you know, day by day, the three different newspapers and the Morning Register, which was the Republican newspaper, uh, basically asked uh, the blacks that were living in Eugene what their opinion was of the Emancipation Proclamation, which had just been passed by Lincoln in 1863. Um, but he, they didn't name them. So there were enough to interview them, but not enough to name them. And even though it was illegal for them to be here, you're still acknowledging that they're here and you're identifying them. Uh, so the first person to really be acknowledged in history was uh, Wiley Griffin. Now, because I'm a student and a practitioner of black psychology, I'm also looking at when discrimination rears its ugly head in the form of racial coded, racially coded language. So Wiley was referred to as an obsequious Chesterfield. Um, and the Evan Hued muleteer and obsequious Chesterfield of the system vainly seeking to coax a, coax a spasmodic burst of speed uh, from the perverse long-eared critter like, you know, mules are stubborn, right? So Paul Headley reading this thought that, oh, well, then the horse is named Chesterfield. No, <laughs> not, sorry. Obsequious, this is American Heritage Dictionary or you know, my online uh, dictionary. Ob obsessive, excessively eager to please or to obey, uh, or it's either a sofa or a coat, but this reference isn't in the dictionary since Wiley isn't either a coat or a sofa. So digging further, um, we're talking about targeted marketing. More black Americans smoke Chesterfield than any other cigarette until World War II, an early example of targeted marketing where basically Lucky Strike used racism to discourage whites from smoking Chesterfield by basically saying it was an N-word cigarette and having them smoke lucky strikes in parliaments and et cetera, et cetera. So today you would find that uh, in prison, for example, very racist place, that menthol cigarettes are targeted toward black inmates and, and traded as currency. Uh, so regular non-menthol cigarettes are basically for everyone else. Um, so Chesterfield is basically a re referring to Wiley and it's a racial reference. So obsequious Chesterfield, just in case you didn't get it. So he's basically, so the context that Wiley is in, it's, it's illegal for him to be here. He has a very public uh, role. He's owning a house, which is also illegal but people are tolerating him. And he's basically, you know, some of the things that we've found is he's a hustler. He's basically going all over the state doing odd jobs for all kinds of people, uh, being a janitor for the U of O. So he's told the U of O's, from the U of O's point of view, he's the first black employee of the universe, at the university, but 
that's not his first employment in Eugene. So what a Southerner would call, and this is the interesting stuff that we found within, there's going to be offensive language. Here's a trigger warning. This is from the Eugene Daily Guard. Um, in another obituary, Wiley was described as what a Southerner would call a good nigger. So obsequious Chesterfield is another way of saying, yeah, okay. So here's this person who definitely requires a lot of resilience to be here, but he's enduring this kind of treatment. So he died at home of what was called, what was called at the time intestinal flux, flu, uh, I guess. He died without a will, but his estate included a grocery list. Someone was taking care of him. Uh, he was described as a good Christian, but not a church named that name that he attended. Uh, never swore, never used profanity, gave kids free rides. Uh, the Elks paid for his funeral. And then eight years after his death, the Elks became one of the organizing nexus of Eugene clan number three. So there was a headstone up until 1959, uh, but it's gone. So initially our project was proposing to replace the headstone and then do a dance with Eugene uh, Masonic Cemetery Association. The headstone became a historical marker. Um, so, so an ongoing effort from 98 uh, to 2019, uh, and it becomes an adventure. So then our first curriculum, proposed curriculum proposal project, uh, we got $5,000 in seed money uh, from the Eugene City Council in the year 2000 for a curriculum for school district 4J. And Sherry's idea was to basically have a fourth grade curriculum because when we presented this information at Churchill High School, at an anti-racism racism conference, uh, before we even left the building, this trench coat kind of kid basically called and complained to his mom that people were telling lies about history and that was a waste of his time and why do I care about black people anyway? And so Sherry had the idea, yeah, maybe we should start before those attitudes harden with elementary school kids. So the problem, of course, at the time was the district moved to non-centralized curriculum when we had this curriculum. And uh, the state didn't have mandated, uh, you know, social studies curriculum until the second decade of the 21st century. Um, so I responded to that block by basically infusing some of the African-American material of the project into Rites of Passage, which started in 94, Ethnic Studies at LCC, which started in 98, along with the U of O, um, Diversa TV, um, the U of O Ethnic Studies in 2017, um, the Eugene Weekly, Register Guard, KLCC, Spectrum Commentaries, and other outlets. So part of the funding that we got from the city was also um, because not all the information was being found in those archives, we not started talking to people uh, that were educators uh, of color. Uh, we were sadly short on uh, Asians, but uh, Nick Sixkiller from uh, Native American community, Jose Luis Alonso, Margaret Johnson, uh, Lily, Lily Reynolds Parker, uh, Willie Mims, uh, Denorval Unthank, and uh, Senator Mark Hatfield were some of the interviews that were recorded. And we also did some historical assists in the uh, basketball sense. So I basically had done radio and other interviews with Kalapulia elders 
and activists like Carol Logan and Esther Stutzman and Eugene, the city of Eugene uh, had a forum on racism and they had what I call the United Nations uh, approach, you know, one black, one Latino, uh, one Asian, but no Native Americans. Why you got no Native Americans? You should actually start with Native Americans. We don't know any. <laughs> okay, I know Esther. Esther can do it. She came in and said, yeah, there's no recognition that, you know, we've gotten terminated. There's no recognition of any of our people. And that conversation uh, led to the project called the Talking Stones and the Willamut uh, Passage Bridge. So Talking Stones, uh, three of them are pictured here. And I believe uh, initially there were 11, I think there's 15 or 16 now. Um, Wilamut means uh, where the water ripples and runs fast. People have asked me, is that where Willamette came from? I don't know. <laughs> but your guess is as good as mine. So when we talk about <coughs> the Kalapuya in terms of native termination, um, so the name of the band of 15,000 people, the San Shivan, or San Shifan, my uh, <clears throat> pronunciation isn't always that good. Uh, so the convention in English is to refer to bands as subgroups of tribes, but legally though, I like to use the word nations because that is their legal status if they're recognized but I like to recognize them as nations, whether they're federally recognized or not, uh, because they're people. Uh, the Kalapuya Nation lived in the Willamette Valley from way down to Yonkala to nearly up to Portland. Uh, the Sanchi Van Band lived uh, in the Eugene Springfield area, the Chela Melas by Country Fair, Vinita, um, and other bands. So they're uh, for example, Kalapuya and Chinook. <clears throat> so there are place names uh, from their languages like Wilamut, Yamel, Molala, Yankala, Sahali, many more. And if it's not an English or French name, it's probably an Indian word. And in the Willamette Valley, probably either Kalapuya or a Chinook word. And Chinook is to Oregon Indians. Uh, some of them what Swahili, key Swahili is to Africans and Latin was to the Romans, a trade language. You still had your tribal language and you also had a language for interfacing with other folks. So reading the English language in the Latin alphabet. So Chinook jargon is what is referred to uh, in the historical and anthropological lit. Um, I'm not sure where Chinook Wawa is taught outside of LCC, but I know the tribes have taken uh, teaching that. Um, so the translations and lexicons. So this is from um, 2002 with a dedication of East Dalton Baker Part, uh, Willamette uh, dedication, Willamut dedication ceremony in the summer of 2002. So Yamel, Yamhill, Coquel, Coquil, Yonkala, Molala. So Esther and her daughter, uh, Shannon in 2002. And a lot of their work continues. So the hearts of those women are not on the ground. People are not defeated until the hearts of their women are on the ground, a Cheyenne proverb. Uh, tent city reenactment. Now LCC BSU um, took the history panels that I'd gotten from the IM uh, and decided, okay, let's do a historical monument uh, to black history. And so 
even though tent city, no, no one necessarily lived in a tent, they lived in wooden buildings, but undeniably the Ferry Street Chapel is in a 20 by 40 foot uh, army tent. So BSU actually bought one from the local surplus store. And one of our elders actually knew how to set it up because he'd done army time. Um, and part of what happened at the Ferry Street Chapel, uh, like many churches in the civil rights era, it could be an organizing nexus uh, for civil rights activity because they had a housing discrimination. And one of my personal heroes, um, Paul Robeson, uh, actually made an appearance at the Ferry Street Chapel. Um, so, I'll plunge on. So if you trace and you study white supremacist organizations and their infiltration into mainstream society. Uh, so you can draw a line from the Knights of the Golden Circle who basically wanted to have uh, Southern Oregon split off from the rest of Oregon and be a slave owning state. Um, the Ku Klux Klan the White Citizens Council, uh, the American Nazi Party, racist skinheads, promise keepers, uh, proud boys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, tracing that lineage from people like Samuel Thurston that we've already talked about uh, and looking at pre-Klan, shall we say legislation, poll taxes, uh, basically every Negro, Chinaman, Kanaka, and mulatto. So Negro is what we call African-Americans today. Chinaman was the technical term for people from China. Kanaka was the term for Hawaiians. And for example, the Knights of the Golden Circle wanted to basically have a slave state where they imported and enslaved Hawaiians, Chinese, African-Americans, uh, Native Americans, if there were any left, and mulattoes and other folks like that. So the Knights of the Golden Circle, uh, when we talk about changing the name of Lane, the county because of Joe Lane's racist history, uh, even though I've had arguments with uh, historians who have talked about, well, technically he wasn't part of uh, the Knights of the Golden Circle. He wasn't a member, um, but his son-in-law was. And well, his son-in-law was. Well, it's because his daughter was homely and who else could he marry her off to? Really? That's your argument. All right, clan terms. Uh, Grand Dragons controls a state. Grand Cyclops controls a city. Uh, Clavern is a local meeting uh, and from special collections, we got a picture of Joseph Dunn, Frederick Dunn rather, uh, head of the U of O Latin department and the Klan, as well as the legal profession uses Latin, the so-called dead language as part of their tradecraft in terms of their rituals and things like that. He was exalted Cyclops of Eugene Klan Number three, uh, the Klan's offices were in the Beckwith building, which is now um, the uh, music hall across from the Hult Center. Uh, Secretary is Michael J. Thompson, the members and uh, included Shy Huntington. Um, that's the picture of the Beckwith building, looking southeast on Willamette and the registered guard. And it was a Klansman that owned the Eugene Daily Guard that bought the morning register, thereby creating the register guard. 
So Frederick Dunn, few faculty members. Uh, U of O didn't have a student clavern, but there were half a dozen students basically sympathetic to it. Um, and when we talk about infiltration, clan members included a county commissioner, city officials, uh, local national guard, rector of the Episcopal church, the newspaper publishers, dentists, surgeons, uh, Elks Club, Chamber of Commerce. So Dunn School, Ben Doris of Doris Ranch, Shelton, um, publisher of the Daily Guard, Democratic newspaper, and Shelton Turnbill Printing uh, was sold by those families, so it was no longer, hadn't been actually associated with them for a long while. So Walter Pierce, uh, Democratic governor, Casper K. Kubley, who's mentioned in this story of Eugene, um, but not his clan connection, was basically given an honorary membership because of his uh, initials, KKK. And so there were 400 members uh, in attendance at the cross burning on um, at the fairgrounds and on the Spencer's Butte, Skinner's Butte, excuse me. 400 members in attendance at the cross burning of the clan at the fairgrounds. And uh, officially, the clan died in 25, but uh, Sherry basically found in the Oregonian in 1937, the year that Joseph Dunn died, that the Klan met near Portland, claimed 16,000 members statewide, and was going to make Eugene their headquarters, their state headquarters again. And they were going to organize in politics, law enforcement, um, and there's nothing to indicate in the historical record or according to experience of the black community and law enforcement and the intelligence community, clans do not die, they go underground. So this was a registered guard article that actually had given them the uh, clan list and they didn't print it. So showing, I guess we could skip this because we're not basically running out of time and I don't want to really necessarily name folks, but essentially um, prominent citizens basically indicating a diffusion throughout the community and uh, being able to influence uh, business affairs and things like the community norms and mores. A prominent Klansman uh, admitted to Marvin Revol, uh, who was then a policeman and also president of the NAACP, that he was a Klansman. And this person is named on buildings and parks. And there we go. There we have it. So clan didn't die. So y'all can play that back if you want. Sherry always says, why are you showing the clan tag? Well, I'm just saying, 2004, people are assisting, it's gone. <laughs> They're tagging. <laughs> now, I had this long conversation with Eckhart uh, because I digitized his, some of his slides, which included, uh, you know, there's a whole piece I, can, I have done on the clan. Uh, and I digitized some of his slides and he said, 
Yeah, well, historians have this um, frame of reference where if you can't you you can't say, say somebody's in the Klan unless they're on a Klan list. They said, but they're a clandestine organization. They made the mistake of having that list published in 22. They're not going to do that again. So, you know, just like the police and the military say, if you got a toy gun, we're going to treat that like a real gun. If you're burning crosses, if the black community is saying, these folks are burning crosses not only into the 70s, and it ceased to being reported as news by the registered guard, which now we know why, uh, because even though the bakers might not have been part of the Klan, they definitely had reporters who were clannish uh, in their reporting of the news, especially about the black community and discrimination. Um, so one week after 9-11, a black woman living in Springfield reported to the police that there were some drug dealers selling meth and uh, thereafter a cross was burned on her lot. So how did the drug dealers find out that she had dropped a dime on them. Hmm. So Mr. Robeson, so if we talk about who fights the Klan and Mr. Robeson, uh, Paul Robeson, a civil rights activist, um, I have basically been pursuing a lead talking with Willie Mims because he remembered Paul Robeson being um, at Ferry Street. And uh, he thought that Hatfield had brought him to uh, Ferry Street. And that turned out not to be the case, but Hatfield did bring Paul Robeson to Oregon. Uh, the Sandells uh, were basically instrumental in bringing Paul Robeson to Tent City, um, or we know it as the uh, across the bridge community. So this map I used um, is from 1948. Uh, and I used it as um, in the, the fight, because it was a fight to Martin Luther King Boulevard, because there are people making the historical argument, oh, it's centennial, we don't want to desecrate our Oregon history, but this identifies that road as Old Patterson Road. And hmm, was this the same Patterson that was on the Klan list that got two Catholic teachers fired from the Eugene School District? And this is Old Patterson Road. So maybe if we change it from a Klansman to civil rights activist, and it seems to run by the yeah, Martin Luther King Boulevard runs through the hood and in other cities. And that was the hood because it was outside of the city limits using that map at both the city council and also the planning commission. Um, <laughs> so Ferry Street Chapel is now St. Mark's CME Church. And Paul speaking outside the church. And the original caption uh, from this particular photograph, singing from the steps of a small chapel in Eugene, Paul Robeson entertains a small group after speaking on behalf of Henry Lott Wallace, the presidential candidate uh, from on the Progressive Party ticket. Now, the interesting thing with the Progressive Party is uh, they were anti-segregation. They were for health care for all. They were for women's rights. They, a lot of interesting uh, platforms for this, uh, per, you know, against Jim Crow laws, uh, which basically we were having Jim Crow laws in uh, Eugene. And uh, yeah, Paul was considered a communist even though he was not part of um, the communist party. 
So Eugene civil rights movement. I think I'll stop here with two questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. That was really uh, eye-opening, I think, for many of us. So uh, thank you much. And there are a number of ways that you can uh, raise a question if you want. You can bring up a question in the chat function. Um, if let's you, see, you can also raise a question, I'll look here in the participants thing. I can't see this because I am a host, but you should see if you, um, click on the participants uh, thing down at the bottom, all of you who are in the audience, you should see next to your name, uh, a little blue hand and you, it looks kind of like that. And if you click on that, then it shows you as having raised your hand. And so I'll also watch for that, but um, we'll call on whoever would um, like to ask Mark a question. Come on, people, don't be shy. All right. I'm sorry, my blue hand is not working. This is Lucy. All right, Lucy. Oh, I have so many questions. Um, the first is, forgive me my ignorance, but you used a term, I think it was BIPOC kids. Was it B-I-P-O-C? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm ignorant. Yeah. What is that? Um. I don't know where that term came from, oh. but these kids, uh, and I'm speaking from being a 65 year old maroon person. Um, maroon is the, the indigenous word from the Taino, which means a first generation black African and native mix. And it also <laughs> means wild and free. So maroon doesn't mean being abandoned on an island. It's a actually position um, because Maroons basically came here before Columbus, right? And the natives are acknowledging that. So uh, BIPOC came out of uh, sort of, I think it's the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. where it stands for Black, Indigenous, Persian or people of color. color. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Another person who's raised their blue hand is Stephen Myers. Hey, Stephen. Actually, it's Karen Myers. Can you hear oh, me? Hey, Karen, yeah. Hello, Mark. We go back a long way, don't we? We do, yeah. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, having immersed myself in books like White Fragility, Stamp yeah. from the Beginning, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Etc. cetera, uh, ever since the Black Lives Matter movement started. Uh, where do we go from here, Mark? I mean, I've been in this town since 1970. And, you know, I, I must admit my ignorance about what's been going on. And I'm, I'm eager to learn. I'm eager to know what, since I'm retired now from LCC with plenty of time on my hands, uh, <laughs> what I can do uh, to be part of moving this forward and helping educate the community, educate myself, and put some positive energy into making changes? Um, one of the things that, and, and I'm, I'm speaking as an elder, because I guess I'm an elder now, um, is one, one of the things that these kids don't understand. So the B Black Lives Matter movement <laughs> You know, basically, yes, there is protests, but there's a limit to what you can do with protests. You still have to build, you can, you still need to build something. You still need to build a movement that won't be destroyed. And one of the things that I like from uh, Alicia Garza's new book, basically, The Purpose of Power. So she, Black Lives Matter came from a poem that she had posted on Facebook, that whole term. And she basically said, look, there's chess moves that you have to make with power mm -hmm. to enact certain changes, okay, that you have to go beyond the protests, you have to build something. It's not just tearing stuff down, it's building something. So I had a, um, I still have a niece that was part of Black Lives Matter in Los Angeles, 
um, that was, you know, protesting Trayvon and stuff like that. And uh, basically they were having a preschool protest at Parker Center in Los Angeles. And then five minutes after the picture where she's mugging with the police line, she gets knocked to the ground and, you know, not only are arrested, but all her contacts, including me, absorbed. And so one of the things that you, they often fail to understand that was kind of revealed within these recent protests is that you can be infiltrated. And like in, for example, was talking about democracy now, 97% uh, of the protests were peaceful, 3% had violence, and the violent actors were white supremacists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Joining the movement yeah, to- Frozen, Mark. Yeah. I'm frozen? Maybe it's me that's frozen. Yeah. I, You're fine, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you read things like, um, you know, white fragility, um, part of, to the degree that I lie to white people, I might not say how bad it is. Because what was once done to us because of race is now being done to you for the money. So you're best to be hip to the game. And so rather than feel guilty about what has been done to us, notice that it's being done to you and it has been done to you. So you've got your own racialized trauma to deal with at the hands of other white people. Like Game of Thrones is you know, not only crushing misogynists, but it also reflects a real history if your folks came from Europe, if your folks came from England, if your folks came from you know, power differentials. So some of these books give us a language to talk about it and to be able to move beyond it because anti-racist is not just being anti-racist, it's becoming more humane, more human, more kind, more scientific in the face of, you know, some of our colleagues were Klansmen at LCC. Yeah. They were, literally. Mm -hmm. And they had their own racialized trauma and I was able to talk with them because I'm a medical person. I, my solutions therefore have to be oriented. I have skinhead clients. So I'm forced to find a solution, not hate you, but deal from a place of strength because people are definitely not expecting Mark Harris to look like me. <laughs> Right, but you find a medical, scientific, rational solution because they're fear. The, the latest iteration of the work that I'm doing is a uh, Jedi Sith. Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Sith steeped in the hate. So from a cultural framework, in the Navajo way, anger is a combination of fear and sadness. Fear for what you've lost, sadness for what you've lost, and intensified to hate. Hate is extreme anger. So you have to heal it, but you don't want to feel vulnerable. And so basically you can engage with people from a certain point of view, but you have to be calm to reach them. So that's part, part of being anti-racist is also becoming more humane. They may still kill you, but you're not afraid of dying. And that brings your, a certain power to your acts. And so that's what M Malcolm was talking about. We need understanding with each other because certainly even the Black Panther Party here made outreach to the White Citizens Party in Veneta that was doing cross burnings. That was part of their strategy. They wanted to do freedom schools, which the basic curriculum of freedom schools is ethnic studies and rites of passage, right? And so, you know, all through rites of passage, you know, white people would ask, what about white people? Yeah, 
you need to do the cultural work that we've done about the pain of your history. You need to do that because if, you know, we tell you the solution, you're not going to believe it from us. You got to find it for yourself. So part of that fragility is, okay, we got to strengthen that. Long-winded answer, but. Thanks, Mark. Three participants raised hands. Yes, we've got three people in order. Uh, Lisa Ponder, then Jeff uh, Corner, and Lucy. So Lisa first. Hi, thanks so much, Mark. I always enjoy listening to you and I always learn. Um, our kids were in school together and that's when I think when I first met you. Um, I want to, to add a little bit to the question just a moment ago, of what can we do? And this is a nuts and bolts thing that uh, very concrete that someone can do and it fits with everything Mark's been saying. I, I speak as a monument maker, a memorial maker. Uh, for two decades, I've been working to try to create tangible historical places that record and preserve non-white history locally. And so I was involved in designing the talking stones, carving the talking stones, getting them in place to preserve those Kalapuyu words like Willamut and I designed it so that the English translation gave a visual of what the meaning was, where the river ripples and runs fast, um, for example. And I worked with uh, Kalapuya elders and um, quite a process. Another is the Japanese American Memorial. We really don't talk about internment. That's not a proper word, it's incarceration. The Japanese American Memorial Plaza and the stories there. Um, another is the monument that we just put in two years ago about uh, the Mims house and the stories there. And I've preserved some of those stories there. Uh, so those are three of the places I've, I've locally created to preserve non-white history. Um, there are others that need to be done locally and others that are tangential like Wayne Morris Free Speech Plaza which I helped design and carve. Um, and I helped choose the quotes on the walls. Uh, they took about three fourths, of, two thirds of the quotes that I proposed. Um, and that fits with our local history because Wayne Morse was a, a, a leader within the national NAACP. Um, and then, well, anyway, that's, that's just, a few of the places locally that I've worked on and I'm, I'm eager to work on others. But the thing that you can do is protect those places, protect them from vandalism, honor them, care for them, keep checking in on them, treat them like family members or your own family um, heirlooms. Go, oh, go there, take people there, show them, teach them and, and protect them. Like the Kalapuya Talking Stones was a long process and we put them in the finally, the installation was on a Sunday in December. We finished at five o'clock, which is really dark. Okay. Eight in the morning on Monday morning, Charlotte Bim is riding their bike into Eugene. They were already vandalized. Letters knocked out, dirt put in them, paint of a Christian, of fish, etc. Okay, the two cities are called Springfield and Eugene. Springfield said, okay, we're coming to document it. Eugene said, oh, we'll go quick clean it up and quiet it up. Okay, so it was immediate. And, and Esther's granddaughter saw that and cried and said, that's us, that's us. This was the first place that could be destroyed as anti Kalapuya because they don't have a, a synagogue to throw rocks through and shoot bullets through. They don't have, you know, it's not an easy target, but the Kalapuya talking stones were the one of the first things that were really expressing the Kalapuya and that's what got targeted. So what you can do, Karen, everybody, 
go to those places, protect them, teach people about them, make them a part of your own consideration of where you live. When, when the shootings of, of some of the black men happened in the last couple of years, the MIMS Memorial became a place where people put flowers and notes and cards. It became an, a, a focus point for people's grief. Anyway, that's what I would suggest is you can do is teach people, take them there, learn more and, and make it a part of your, your tour of when people come to visit, for example. And if anybody has other ideas of, of local uh, things that need to be done from a monument point of view, talk to me. Thank you, Thank Mark, you. for bringing this Thank forward. Thank you, Lisa. Um, th and what I said about said to Karen about um, sometimes we lie. Basically, the lie is these things are subject to attack. And I'm glad you brought up uh, the talking stones. I mean, I'm I'm doing work with the NAACP several times a week, so you know I'm always thinking, um. Oh, this could be an obvious target in times like these. I thought that uh, the Wiley Memorial would be vandalized, but people are leaving flowers, people are leaving money. It has become kind of like a, a shrine. So, yeah, you know, and I'm aware of, you know, because when Alice talks, Alice Aiken uh, talks about, you know, it's a Japanese American memorial. Um, and yeah, I, I honor that but understand that the legal principle of arresting and incarcerating people on the basis of race still exists. Absolutely. Has never been rescinded, has been upheld by the US Supreme Court. Yes. All right, and that can affect everybody yes. of like mind, even though we're obviously in the majority. So definitely, any kind of space that we can memorialize our memory and our humanity is a good thing. And I personally have a, the, the Du Bois quote that you carved into stone. So I'm definitely a fan yep. of your work. You do. <laughs> Freedom always in, entails a little bit of danger. Thank you for that. Um, we have three more questions. Uh, first, Jeff. Hi there, uh, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing what you, you've done. Um, I'm a member of a, a volunteer service organization. And during one of these sort of Zoom social times, I was saying, um, you know, in view of uh, the riots and uh, let, let, let's see, what's, uh, I'm noting where our club occasionally we get some non- white people joining us and um, thinking, okay, this is, this is a good thing. But then they last for a few months, serve wonderfully and then disappear. And I look at the roster to see why they left and it's just things aren't really specific. I know, I don't dr drop this uh, phrase. So uh, look, I said, look at us now. We sometimes get non-white people in here, but look, our whole club is full of whiteies. What, let's let's talk about this. Let's deal with racism and sexism. And let's see. And there were some uh, women in the group, and I thought, okay, there's probably some sexism that they've experienced. I thought, okay, this will be a means in. The topic immediately changed to something else, and it went nowhere. Um, what can I do? Um, what can I learn from that experience? <laughs> uh, uh, what can I do to, to go forward and, um, or I'm you know, just kind of throwing this out there. So uh, any input would be very welcome. Thank you. Sure. Um, I teach a class, I'm a yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in my conceptual framework, uh, yoga came out of Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, um, in its original form, Christianity is an African religion that required meditative skill to pull off many of the things 
um, that are actually normal and human, normal human capabilities, but are characterized as miracles. Well, okay, not so. But they are a difficult. It is a difficult conversation. You have to basically be able, um, like I referenced, uh, for example, the Navajo um, construct about anger. But in order to do that, you have to embody the twins, Monster Slayer, who's the warrior and born from water who's the healer and you need the you need the warrior to penetrate the monsters who are basically the monsters are your relatives so there's you know that's the instructions they got you have to penetrate and uh, be eaten by the monsters not destroyed because the warrior needs to go to the scary place and the healer needs to be able to see where the monster is trapped. Okay, I so think. if I see that you're willing to have not only the difficult conversation, but remain within your discomfort until it becomes comfortable, okay? Like in a yoga context, full lotus. I can't do full lotus, I can do a half lotus, but when I was 17, I can do full lotus. That was uncomfortable. In my yoga framework, we do kundalini yoga, which kundalini lotus, which means you've got your your legs up at a 45 degree angle with grabbing your toes and balancing on that while doing breath of fire. Okay? So you have to have core strength to be able and balance to be able to pull that off. So that's what I'm saying in terms of having those difficult conversations. Yes, a lot of times the people, I couldn't do my job, I couldn't exist in Oregon unless I was comfortable with white people, okay. right? And sometimes yeah. that means, okay, listen, I'm gonna be upfront about this conversation. You basically said a racial microaggressions like, uh, you know, I'm sitting in my office, I make an appointment on the phone, a uh, woman comes in, I'm looking for Mark Harris, I'm single person office, so that's me. Oh, you don't look the way you sound over the phone. All right, so, oh, yeah, and that happened, that happens a lot in Eugene, right? So oh. I say, okay, so that was a microaggression, mm -hmm. okay? Micro resistance is, I sound taller, oh yes. Okay, in my mind, in your mind's eye, what did I look like? Oh, six, eight, blonde hair, blue eyes, and then her voice trails off, and I go, well, <laughs> I'm paid to sound white, but my voice is black at the roots. Now, you were expecting me to speak Ebonics. This is a medical office. I come from a medical family. <laughs> my mother's a school teacher, father's a one of the top black psychiatrists in the country, okay. according to a black surgeon general. Uh, yeah, I have to speak precise English, mm -hmm. California newscaster English, <laughs> right? No accent, right? right? So, you know, you must be from Oregon. Right. Oh, how'd you guess? Uh, this is how black professionals sound from LA. And I know lots of them. So, okay, now here, here's a learning piece. So ah, nice. at LCC, if there's talk about not hiring a white woman from Brooklyn to teach Spanish because she has a Brooklyn accent, and you're having this conversation, really, seriously, Huh, that's kind of hick. Yeah. I'm, and I'm just saying, that's kind of hick. Yeah. You need to actually kind of broaden your horizons because you're not training people for Marcola. You're training people from the world. This is the university. Okay? So, right? Okay. And I said, look, I'm from LA. Yep. Right? So, the black professionals or black community people that would uh, interface with your organization have to be able to know that you know their reality 
mm. and talk about the reality. Okay, I and understand to. where that's coming from. Because some of the violence, so, you know, it's not about defunding the police, it's actually funding a cahoots like situation in whatever city you're in. Because the Eugene police killed a white boy who was off his meds on Hawkins Lane because he came at them with a steak knife. And they shot him. Okay, so that happened in Eugene. Yeah. Right? So responding to mental health crisis is not what the police are trained for. There are people who are trained for that. Yeah, he did freeze. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But it's not just me. Okay, Mark, you're frozen. Can you call? Brad. Yeah, I'm not quite. Um... Randy, any suggestions? Uh, not really. I think he was on uh, all CC's uh, internet. That's about as good as you can get in this town. Yeah, he's frozen. Though. Maybe he'll come back out and then back in. Hmm. review of everybody. Um, hmm. Hmm. We'll give. Oh, sounds like he's coming back in. We'll give him a minute to see if he can come back in. So we've got three more questions. He's obviously having trouble. Yeah. This is the problem with Zoom. <laughs> I'll just say. Uh, there he comes. Uh, Excellent. Be sure to unmute yourself, Mark. There. Stupid computers. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the, the, bottom, the basic bottom line is the, you ne we need to understand the hidden history behind some of the things that we don't understand so that we have understanding mm. of that. And if that means going to a scary place, you know, scary becomes familiar through training. First responders run towards danger because of their training. You know, you want to deal with your anxiety, build your skill. Uh, okay. Because okay? anxiety can be tamed with sufficient skill. Then you can run towards danger. Mm. Skills are better than pills. <laughs> yes. Good Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have Lucy and then Miranda and then Michelle might want to raise a question. So Lucy. Sure, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to the Ku Klux Klan for a moment. Uh, I'll make a, a statement and then ask my question. Um, I'm, I was very interested since I'm fairly new to Eugene in Oregon um, and lived for 40 years in um, Colorado, moved here. 1920s in Denver in particular, but you know, in, in a lot of Colorado has this really similar story. The Klan took over much of the Colorado state 
uh, government and, and uh, especially the mayor of Denver, which the uh, old airport, he was, it was named after Stapleton, blah, 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 include cross burning on uh, Jacob Coors land out near Golden, Colorado, right above the brewery on a big bluff, a uh, table mountain out there. Anyway, because the population of Denver area at that time didn't have a huge percentage of African Americans, the Klan also had to target um, the Semites, the Jewish folks. So my question is, I, and in Denver, really, that you know, they did target the, the West Denver Jewish neighborhoods quite a bit. But my question is, since I don't know that much about Oregon and Eugene area, was the Klan here at the same time targeting other ethnic groups other than African Americans? Because I don't even know now what the population, the percentage of population that Eugene or even Lane County has of you know non-white or persons of color. So my question is, were there enough people for the KKK to target specifically in the Eugene Springfield area? Yes, they were. Uh, the narrative was they were basically anti-Catholic and then anti-Jewish because there were Catholic people and Jewish people here. Not a whole lot of black people, uh, at least not enough to raise their ire, so to speak. Um, so for example, if you, if you focus on the university, Basically, if you only have one black student at the university and a couple on the football team, that's not enough. But where that starts to change is like after 37, when more black people start coming in because of the railroad and also because of the war effort, like in Portland, a lot of people working for Kaiser and the shipyards and all those other kinds of things in the late 30s and early 40s. And this is where you, you still, it's a red line sundown town, which means you can't live within the city limits and you can't be on the street after dark, right? So they established those laws before there was a significant black presence, but there was a black presence that basically kind of intensified their ire. So at the time of the early cross burnings, like in the twenties, there was like one or two black people passing through, um, but they weren't necessarily targeting them. It was only when their numbers increased so that they started doing that. So yes, Adolf Coors, he liked Adolf, the other Adolf, right? So I'm glad you brought that up. So it, it's a very similar story. Um, and then, you know, there is that narrative usually spread by the Klan that, oh, they disappeared in 1925. Uh, no, they don't do that. So if, I mean, I spoke with a Klansman that was on payroll at LCC. And I said, well, I, you know, I said the convert, he said, why do you think I'm a Klansman? I said, I'm a mandatory reporter the cops and the intelligence community warned me against meeting with you. Now, I called you out without naming you in a, in a group email and you wanted to talk to me, so here I am. So this is where it's at. You know, it's like, I'm not afraid of you, but there are people that are afraid of you, right? I have skinhead clients, so What's your history? We're both grandparents. We're both, you know, raising adult kids. Sometimes the adult kids don't do what we want them to do. Your adult kids didn't, you know, publicly embarrass you, but yeah, the cops raided your house. So for white cops to storm your house in tactical gear, they're afraid of you. So those are the people that told me you're a Klansman and you're on LCC payroll. So that's not unusual. Lots of people have been on, on LCC payroll that are questionable, but 
Okay. And he basically revealed that, you know, his alcoholic father beat him and uh, basically you know, beat him for having a black friend in elementary school. And, uh, you know, that uh, pain gets translated elsewhere. And so, yes, he came by his hate honestly, but not because of anything we did to him, but at the hands of abuse. So that's why you have to understand that a lot of times people's anger is driven by their abuse history, their alcoholic abuse history. Yeah, so Adolf Coors. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's what I'm saying we have to courageously get into uncomfortable situations and definitely like the president elect uh, says, we have the work ahead of us. And there are other people who say, no, it's a waste of time to dealing with that. Well, I, I can't necessarily think that it's a waste of time, but again, I'm remaining humane. And that is part of anti-racist work, becoming more human. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Miranda has a question. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Mark, for your time and your incredibly detailed and illuminating uh, presentation. I found so much that I still need to learn. I recently moved here, but um, I have a lot of family in Eugene and or family history as well. So looking to learn more. And my question to you um, is that I'm, I'm curious about uh, how, about the community response to the I2M Eugene project. Um, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how that maybe has evolved since 1997 and um, where you see enduring obstacles and also where you see moments of hope. My daughter, who's the office manager for the NAACP said, you guys got to grow up. <laughs> And I go, what do you mean by that? Look, get a business license, get nonprofit status, make your website serious. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it's not bringing in any money. We have to like survive. We have to pay the mortgage, the rent, et cetera, et cetera. But you're right, right? Um, I would say that we've revealed uncomfortable truths um we've paid for that but so for example i've been been infusing the material at least the african-american material where i can basically because i have academic freedom and i can you know present and you know do television and do classes and stuff like that and i've tried to present it for example the resistance even though this is sponsored by the u of o other sections of the U of O, look, I have an entire class who presented this material in 2017. You should continue this because the community needs it. I've even offered to record the entire class, put it online and have it for free at the Black Cultural Center. Crickets. So I'm not sure what the, where the resistance is coming from. It's not from history. <laughs> it's from ethnic studies. It's from, yeah, I'm not sure where, where, where that is coming. So, you know, basically putting it out on the website, putting it out in forums like this. Um, we're basically working on a project, Strides for Justice, uh, collaborating with Peace Health, uh, basically creating an app uh, that's basically historical sites, some historical sites, you know, with running and all the walking and all those, because we've already done a bus tour, we've already done a bike tour. It's basically just creating the, you know, the uh, online application so that people can see this kind of stuff. Because we want to hand this off to our kids, um, you know, you know, I've, I'm technically retired, <laughs> right? But yeah, I think that, and we're constantly adding to more. So there have been interesting 
blocks, but I've, I like the blocks because this just means, you know, that, you know, if you just the Wiley Griffin Memorial, the fact that we proposed it in 98 and the first CEO at eWeb told us $500 was too much. Wait, you just put up something a year ago that cost more than $500, but it's not the same CEO. So weird blocks, but you overcome it. So, but I think other communities need to be able to do this as well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, Mark. I see that we're at time, even though we have a couple of questions. Um, I'm okay I, with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I wanna honor everybody's time that they have taken for today. So thank you so much for speaking to us tonight and answering uh, a good many questions. And uh, we wanna invite you all uh, back again in a month for uh, uh, Eliza Candy Jones' um, talk on race and suffrage in Oregon. I think that uh, she is a fabulous historian and um, I'm sure it will be a fabulous talk. So please join us again next week. Um, Mark, is it possible? I've got several people in the chat who um, perhaps if you could respond to them or give them your email address in the chat so that people could contact you, uh, that would be fabulous. But I will also state that uh, it takes a couple of days for Zoom to process the recording, but once it's processed, I send it to um, Bob and he will post it on the uh, Lane County History Museum's website uh, for you to see it or you to share it with your friends. Please join me in once again clapping for uh, Mark and his fabulous talk. Thank you so much, Mark. It was really Thank great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Our pleasure. Oh, great. It so felt maroon cryo at Gmail. Maroon so, Rio at Gmail. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Stay well, stay strong. Stay healthy. Marcia, I saw 34. Uh, yeah, I had uh, 30, 34 was the most that we right. had. Okay. And that includes three of us, so 31 and okay. 31 audience. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Super. Okay, thank you. Good night.